No, it's good. Hey, for everybody online, we're, uh, um, we got the mic ready for you. We're ready to go. Um, well, again, welcome, everybody. Good morning. I'm Kalpa Seymour, Vice Chair for the Western Territory, and uh, excited to be here. And, I'm, and Dick and I are going to be doing a presentation today on creating the board, having the right members, um, which can be a difficult task, right? I think that's probably the biggest elephant in the room is like, how are we going to put this together? And so Dick's going to kick it off here with uh, some topics, and then I'm going to get into some recruiting and networking. Um, but let me, oh, I realize I, was, I thought wrong slide. So this is what we're doing. So of course, welcome again. He's going to talk about creating an advisory board, the committees, um, the operating essentials. And then, like I said, I'm going to go into a little bit of recruiting and networking. And then we want to leave some time for Q&A, because we really want to hear what, what's on your mind. You know, what's already, what's working, what's not working, and how do we best set you up for success? So we're looking forward to those questions. So Dick, let's uh, have you kick it off. Thank, thank you, Kaltha. Uh, I'm going to just pick up for just a word or two on what Joey had to say uh, about recruiting members, and also Kath is going to do that. So we're all going to overlap in that area because it's so critical. Uh, I also have two handouts, back to my uh, Ronald Reagan era thing. I, you should have two handouts. One says the categories of board membership, and uh, believe it or not, this list is uh, we had every one of these categories represented at one time or another on our Modesto board, and it's critical. I'm, I'm just giving you ideas. This is not. This is a great board, but you got to create your own great board. But I wanted to give you some ideas of what it makes up a great board. This is one I created from scratch. It's my baby, and it's called the attributes of a great advisory board or council. And I would suggest that you emboss this, engrave it, you frame it, and you put it in your boardroom because these are the 10 essentials. These are the 10 essentials of what make a board work and what makes the board and the officer relationship work and what makes the local operation work. This is it. This is my, if you will, the 10 commandments that I like to spread, and it's just so critical. So the other comment I'd make on what Joey said is that uh, Absolutely, shoot for the best. Absolutely, shoot for the best. Look for the best, but you know, you also have to have people that do the work. You have to have people that do the work, and sometimes you get all executives, and you end up with people where you don't have working committees, and you don't have people. And so, at the bottom of my list, you'll, and I'm sorry I put it at the bottom, it's just where it ended up when I thought about it. At the bottom, it's just, it's just a housewife, and it isn't just a housewife. We need to get right down and all the essentials. We've got to have people at work. Just as a crazy example, in Modesto, we had the finance committee. Three of us on the board were CPAs, and none of us served on the finance committee. You believe that? The finance committee was run by a business guy who was the, the controller for a large company and the office manager for one of the companies that I worked with. And so the CPAs weren't even on the finance committee. So that's an irony, but you got to be think, thinking about it. you got to be creative. How do we fit these people in to do what they do? And there's an old adage about how you do what you do. You do best what you like to do. And so we find what people like to do, and we try to get them in to do that because they'll do that in the best way. One One last comment on... On, on recruiting, and this is very personal. <laughs> My dad was a lifelong Rotarian. He loved Rotary. Oh, he thought Rotary was the greatest thing ever. When I moved to Modesto, I was a young CPA. I had about four years business, five years business experience. I went to join the junior, junior chamber, and finally I went and had the courage to go over, and I knocked on the door of the guy who ran the Rotary, and I said, hi, I'm uh, new to town, and I'd like to join the Rotary. Never forget, the guy was sitting at his desk. He didn't even look up. He said, tell me why. I said, well, because my dad was a Rotarian. And I'm new to town, and I want to make contacts, and I really want to get in and make a, some, an impact for the community. And he never looked up. He said, go away, make an impact, and then come back and talk to me. So I went over and joined the Kiwanis. <laughs> 60 years later, I'm still a Kiwanian. Past, past lieutenant governor, regional governor, regional committee director, and international committees, you name it, I did it all in Qantas. I went there because Rotary didn't want me. And let's don't get in that position. You know, let's, let's be sure that we're taking the right people. 
but let's also be analytical and let's make sure that we get that we have our minds open and that we're we're available. Okay, I got to get going because I don't have a lot of time, and I got uh, about uh, about a week's worth of information to give you in the next twenty minutes. So let's start from scratch. I'm not going to talk much about starting from scratch. In the book, on page three, it talks about starting from scratch, and uh, it's a good story, and I think you'll find it interesting. I would tell you. In the new book we've written that we've expanded a lot on starting from scratch. But I just want to give you one word, one word about starting from scratch. You ready? Relationships. It's all about relationships. One day at the Modesto board meeting, we were having a full board. We had about 20 people in the room, board members, and we had others in the room. And the... Uh, the board chairman looked up and he looked around and he kind of smiled. We were talking about recruiting new members. He said, how many people are in this room are board members of this organization because Dick Haggerty asked them to join this board? Stand up. Eleven people stood up. Eleven people stood up because of relationships that I had with those people. And I knew who they were and I was very active in town and I was, con I was connected and I was going out to the people that I knew A, were connected, and B, would work hard, and C, would fit the image of who we were. So build on those relationships. The other thing, and I don't want to get on Calthus. She's going to talk about recruiting. The other thing is that your board needs to be the basic recruiter. I'm talking to a bunch of officers here, but you don't know the town. You don't know the town. So be careful when you go out and talk to your board people before you get too committed into recruiting. Uh, we had one situation in Modesto where the officer went out and invited somebody in, and it turned out it was an attorney, a really nice guy. He was a pretty good friend of mine. He had sued the Army a couple of years before and won a pretty big lawsuit locally, and that didn't go over real well with the board. Um, had another situation where a different board officer, where a different officer came in and said, I'd like to uh, promote this guy uh, for a board membership. And I said, yeah, that's probably okay, but let's wait till he gets off probation because he was still uh, on federal probation for income tax evasion. And I thought, you know, this is a pretty good guy, but maybe we should wait until he gets his record clear before we take him. So as board, as, as, as officers, I'm just cautioning you to be careful and understand who you're recruiting. That's not to say you, the officers, shouldn't be recruiting. I absolutely believe you should be recruiting for board membership as well as the board, but you need to know the local game. And so just, just be careful. Okay, having said that, uh, starting from scratch is a, is a huge story, and it's covered in this book, it's covered in the new book, and if you want to talk about it at halftime or after hours, I'd be happy to expand some more on it, but it's a very, it's a very difficult task, and uh, it's something you just have to work at. It's just plain hard work, and uh, there's ways to do it, and I've spelled those out in the book. I don't think we need to, uh, I don't think we, we need to belabor that. Again, you need to recruit the right members. Um, need to organize the board. Right off the bat, the board has to be organized. You have to have a chairman. You have to have a chairman. I, uh, I helped form a council in Stockton. The ARC didn't have a council. And I walked, uh, the officer called me and he said, Dick, can you help us start a council? I said, sure. So I came up and met with him and I called a couple of my buddies from Modesto took them up. I took a, called a couple of people who had been on a council years ago per the records and they came to the meeting and uh, four or five of us sat there and I looked at the officer and I said, you know, first off we do, first off we have to have a chairman. And he reached over, it was a, it was a lunch meeting, he reached over and he picked up the spoon in front of off his coffee cup and he handed it to me and he said, here's your gavel, you're the chairman. I don't, rec I don't recommend that as being a, a good technique for creating an award officership, but you do need to have a chairman. And so that, it starts there. There, seem, there is a bit of a tradition in the Army, especially at some of the higher boards, for the officers to have the key role in picking who they would like to have as chair, and I think that's, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's excellent because you, the officer, and we, the board, as chair, we've got to get along. We've got to spend a lot of time together. I'm going to tell you, the relationship you have with that board chairman, should be your best relationship in town. He better be your best friend. If he's not, you're going to have a tough year or two or four or five. 
And if he is your best friend, you're going to be spending a lot of time together. And I can tell you that uh, I, can, I, I can't even begin to. Uh, the best story I can tell you, uh, way back in the day, I was working for an auto dealer. I was his uh, uh, kind of his uh, overall manager for his real estate operation. And, and we, we scored a pretty big coup I did. And he said, you can have any car on the lot to drive for free for the next couple of years. So I picked a Porsche. Hey, I got good taste. 911, right? And uh, I'd had that 911 about two or three weeks. And they were having officers' councils in Sacramento. And I called my buddy, the officer, and I said, Jim, Jim, I got a treat for you. He said, what's that? I said, here's the keys to my Porsche. And I said, you take it up there, and you do not tell them anything about where it came from or what it is. It's your car for the next week. And you take it to officers' councils. And I said, oh, by the way, don't be a cheapskate. And I gave him a couple of $20 bills. I said, you're going to have to tip when you putting this car in and taking it out or it isn't going to come back looking so good. And for a whole week, my lieutenant drove around Sacramento in that 911 with these two little boys perched on the back bench. And uh, everybody there thought that he had been given a new Porsche as his officership in Modesto. Well, it probably isn't going to get that good for you, but you never know. And make friends with that officer and the things might, make friends with that board and just some great things might, might happen for you. Behind that chair has to be a vice chair. The vice chair needs to be in training because you really need a vice chair who will step up. I like two-year terms. Uh, my first term as chairman was three years. I thought that the first year you're learning, the second year you're doing great, the third year you're coasting. And um, I've seen other boards where the board chairman stays around for forever. I'm on some Christian mission boards where we've had the same chairman for 20 years. I can tell you, you can it's it shows you need rotation and you need fresh blood and so two years is probably just about right that person sitting in the vice chair should be in training for those two years to come up and by the time that person is ready to take over ready to be the chairman be a seamless you need a secretary and a treasurer the secretarial role probably is pretty pretty honorary because you will no doubt have a, a core secretary, a staff secretary, and that person probably will take minutes for you at your meeting, but not necessarily. And a good board secretary will, will decide which way to go with the, with the staff, but that secretary needs to be in a position to do your minutes and that kind of thing. And your treasurer, your treasurer has the biggest job of all because your treasurer really needs to chair the finance committee. And the treasurer, in my, in my experience, the treasurer has not been in the chain of ascending because we wanted to keep that treasurer right there as the head of the finance committee. And that finance committee is critical. Number one, number one, that finance committee has to be integrally involved in creating the budget. You will find in a small operation where you don't have a business manager, probably your board, probably your board is creating your budget for you. I don't know whether the commissioner likes to hear that or not, but that's reality. And the board is going to be making that the key decisions and the key role in cranking that out. And your board, your board vice, your board treasurer should be the chairman of that finance committee. There's a fifth officer that uh, didn't mention, and that's your past chair. When your officer role, when your board chair rolls off into uh, retirement, it isn't retirement. They just step into the role as past chair and always ready to step back in if there's a problem, if there's a glitch, if there's a resignation, if somebody leaves town, if there's an illness, if there's an absentee and the vice chair isn't in a position to step up, that the past chair needs to be ready to move right back seamlessly into that thing. So you really have three executives sitting there, the current chair, the vice chair, and the prior chair, all equipped, able, and ready to move in and make this happen. Committees. Committees of the board is probably just about my favorite topic. I've spelled out for you here, I think, uh, I've spelled out for you five essential committees. But let me tell you, in Modesto, at one time in Modesto, brace yourself, we had 25 different committees. 25 different committees. Can you imagine? And this is, a, this is a city of only 200,000 and a budget at the time of a million and a half, maybe. But we had 25 committees. Why? Because we found that the committees, we needed to have committees for special 
purposes. We needed, we had some programs that were so big that they needed a, pro, a sh committee all by itself. The shelter had to have its own program. The uh, food bank had to have its own program, uh, committee, excuse me, and so, and so on. And we went through the list and we kept developing more and more and more. Certain of our fundraising events got so big that we had to have a committee for them. Christmas, bell ringing, it, it just went on and on and on. 25 is a lot of committees, folks. 25 is a lot of committees. That's a lot of committee meetings. And you know, the rules, the Army rules say that at every committee meeting, there is supposed to be an official representative. The number one official representative in the room is you, the officer. Okay? I think it's also acceptable to have one of your key staff, your business manager, possibly, uh, your staff secretary, somebody that's a key person. But we're supposed to have Army not just the committee is not supposed to operate just on its own as a committee. It's supposed to have a representative there from the Army. That's Army rules, and that's something we need to remember. The essential core committees. Number one, executive. Executive committee is made up of the officers I just named. Probably a couple of other key board members, depending on the size of your board. If your board is huge, like Modesto's, ours was up somewhere around 40 people, then uh, you're probably going to have four or five at-large members of that committee. It's very important. That committee must meet two weeks off from your regular board date. So your executive committee is going to have two meetings a month just as an executive committee. One for the regular board meeting, but equally important, prior to that board meeting, the executive committee needs to meet. It needs to set the agenda. It needs to set priorities. It needs to receive committee reports and committee recommendations. The executive committee is the one that should be making the proposals and the, the recommendations to be acted on by the full board. I like to say the executive committee does the heavy lifting for the board. If all the details that we do in our community had to be handled at a regular board meeting, that board meeting would last all afternoon. And so we have to have committees first that filter down the information. Second, they put it into brief and they shoot it to the executive committee they filter it down, and they're able to send it on to the full board in a modified, streamlined, and appropriate way where we can act. I hope that makes sense, but it's a critical committee, and you must have an executive committee. I consider other uh, important key committees, finance. Finance committee uh, may, be chair may be combined with exec. If your town is too small, if your board is too small to have too many committees, and I've seen situations where the finance committee and the executive committee are combined. I don't recommend that, but it's, uh, it's acceptable if that's necessary because of the size of your board. The finance committee is responsible for coming up in the end with the budget along with the officer. And Army protocol says the board must sign off on the budget before it comes up to division for approval. And that's, in, that's a must. And I see way too many, way too many cores, way too many operations where the budget on Saturday night gets cranked out by the officer and the board never sees it and it gets sent up to the colonel and it, they go on down the road from there and that's just not the way we do it. Just not the way we do it. If there's any area that comes really close to policy, on our advisory situation, it's in the creation of the budget. But we don't create that budget on our own as a board. We create it in conjunction with the officer and then in approval by upstream. But that's very important that that finance committee understands that role. Property committee, property committee, that's the hardest working committee on the thing because let's face it, the Army is, is a huge, huge landlord. We own more property than any other company in the country, I think. And um, as a CPA, uh, uh, this grinds on me, but I once heard an officer look at me and say, you know, you put assets, all the assets, this building is an asset, these chairs are assets, this mic is an asset. You put all the assets on your balance sheet, you consider them to be assets on a balance sheet, on a proprietary balance sheet. In the Salvation Army, we consider all these to be liabilities because they're wearing out and they're wearing down and they're needing maintenance, they're needing to be taken care of. 
And so from the standpoint that this is an asset, it's also a liability because we've got to keep it up. And the property committee needs to be in a position to do the upkeep, to make the upkeep. That's going to mean you need a contractor or two on your board. Uh, a couple of subcontractors is great. Maybe a paving contractor, a general contractor, because those are the guys. Those are the guys that, are going to, that you're going to call. That may not mean necessarily the guy that's going to fix the lock, but he knows who will fix it. And he has a contact with that person. A good property, a good property committee chairman will make your life way easier. You got a toilet plugged up, who do you call? Well, you're new to town and you aren't quite sure who to call. <laughs> you call the property chairman and the property chairman, he knows who to call. Maybe he's got a snake, a uh, sewer snake and he's back, picking, if he's pick up and he'll come out and fix it. We don't know. The property chairman may be a jack of all trades and he may be in the position to do those fixes. Maybe not, but he knows who to call. This guy's going to make life real, basically easy for you. Trust me. Program committee. Program committee needs to evaluate the programs, refer them, see if they're working, see what else needs to be done. Also needs to propose any new programs that are going to come, in, come into town. In some cases, this can be a huge operation. In Modesto, our main, uh, our main program in Modesto, the homeless shelter, went from a... 75 people at night only, and everybody gone away during the daytime to 400 people full time and 700 meals served three times a day. You think that committee didn't learn on the fly how to work? It became a huge, huge successful committee, and I recommend that you, uh, you pay a real special attention to the program committee because they're going to decide, they're going to help you decide what programs work and which ones don't which ones are a priority, and which ones can we kind of let go by the wayside. And then you need a fundraising committee. Basically, you really need a fundraising committee and a PR committee. But in a small operation, you're probably going to combine those two. And ideally, to do that for a PR committee, you need to get a local newspaper editor. They do publish newspapers still, guys. I, 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 was, I was reading one. Teresa, was, Teresa cuts hair at the ARC for the ladies on Saturday. Saturday I was sitting helping her while I was watching. She's cutting hair for the ladies and I'm reading the Saturday Wall Street Journal and the major walked up and he said, what's that you're looking at? <laughs> My major is a smart aleck, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> but um, the local newspaper publisher, the local newspaper person, the local advertising agency, the local uh, media person of some kind, really you need to grab that person and put them in charge of your PR and life will get a lot easier and you'll get a lot more publicity and a lot more recognition around town. Okay, I'm going to try to get quickly wrap up because, oh, hang on, no, I'm not, okay, come on up, <laughs> flip, flip my slide. She's, this is my... One more comment, one more comment on committees. One more comment on committees. Your best, listen carefully, your best committee member may not be a member of your board. Don't limit committees to board members. We found in Modesto that probably half, half of the members of committees did not belong to the board. They were just community people who had a specific focus and a specific thing they were interested in, and they were willing to come alongside. They didn't want to be on the board. They didn't have the time to do whatever a board relationship was, but they really wanted to help the Army in a specific way. And so be sure and look into your community, community and find ways to build that. Okay, a few operating essentials, and I'm going to give this to Cal too. Number one, the well-planned and organized meeting. Listen carefully. Start on time. Finish on time. You have asked really important, really busy people to come to your meeting. And then Chatty Kathy over here in the corner and Silly Sam over here in the corner go on and on and on and on and on. And the clock grinds on. If you have a one o'clock termination time, it's 1.15. Oh, it's 1.20. If it's a 1.30 meeting you target for, it's two o'clock. You know what? Some of your busy and key people aren't going to be there after the appointed hour. 
Why? Because they allocated a certain specific amount of time, and that's it. And how do you run an efficient meeting? You have it planned. You have a specific agenda written ahead of time with the, with the agreement of the executive committee and the officer, and you lay it out, and you start on time, and you stick to the agenda, and you end on time. It's as simple as that. Participation and input by all. I say a good meeting is a meeting where everybody feels like they were a part of it. They don't necessarily have to speak. Goodness knows we don't want them to speak for five minutes. But everybody has to have an opportunity to, to be involved. And Teresa will tell you this afternoon when, she, you know, when she's talking about auxiliaries, you got to let people talk, but you got to be careful. You can't let them run or take over your meeting. And that's a, that's a really key point. And finally, communication. I can't stress communication enough. Communication runs at every level in our operation. It runs between you and the officer. It runs between you and the staff. It reads between you and the community because now you as a board member or you as an officer are representing the Army. And so we, the Army, are reaching out to the community. It's all about communication. And the biggest glitches I've seen are when communication breaks down. When communication breaks down, bad things happen. And I'm just telling you right now, you better be communicating. And my final word, my final word is a word that I say I'm hammer over and over, and it's the title of my new book. Excellence. Excellence. Act with excellence. We are the best. We are the best organization in America. We've been acclaimed by that by many, many people. Look at us. Most people look at us and say, you're the best. Try to act like it. That's why we're here. We act with excellence. And I'll close with my mantra that I give to every new officer that walks in the board, in the door. You're brand new. You've been sent to Modesto. You come and you stand up in front of us and they call on me. And I get up and I walk over and I put my arm around the captain or lieutenant or envoy or whatever he is or she is. And I say, we were here when you came and we'll be here when you leave. What you do while you're here, we will live with when you're gone. You are the CEO. You're the boss. You're in charge. But we are the Salvation Army in this community. Thank you, Dick. That was outstanding. Thanks for taking us through that. Let's give him a round of applause. That was outstanding. All righty. Okay, so we are going to get into recruiting the right board members. And let me just go, we're going to go to a quick clip here I want to share with you guys. Let's see if I can move this over. Um, this is where I need my own IT person. <laughs> I'm like, how do I close it? I forget how to close this out. And okay, there we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. Can I move this? Yeah. Okay. Who needs a doctor? CRNA. Oh, oh, oh. I like to think of myself. Sorry, let's try that again. I'm a recruiter from locumtenants.com. I call hospitals, private practices, pretty much anybody who needs a doctor, CRNA. I like to think of myself as a college football coach calling high school recruits. Hello, is this Greg? Hi, this is Terry from locumtenants.com, and I was just locum tenants. Locum tenants. It means to stand in the shoe. L O C. Well, I think the difference between a good recruiter and a bad recruiter is probably patience. I stay calm no matter what. No, ma'am, it's locumtenants.com, not localtennis.com. No, not locustendons.com. <laughs> 
did you just say lotiontender.com? Is this a joke? No, no I, I cannot offer you online tennis lessons. I'm not even sure how you would do that. T E N. No, sir, this is not loadedtenants.com. Some days are more patient than others. Are we done? guys are feeling that way about recruiting for a board. <laughs> now, the Salvation Army is well known, and so... Oh gosh. Well, Abby is the newest member of our team. Okay, here we go. Um, but seriously, in all seriousness, how many, raise a hand. How many guys are, are feeling? Anybody feeling that way, sitting here today? Feeling like it's going to be hard? But now, everybody knows the Salvation Army, right? Well-known organization. So I don't think this will be as, as crazy as this cliff. But, um, but it is a challenge, right? So let me uh, get us back here to our deck. OK. Um, I, th I see recruiting as a board like a jigsaw puzzle. How many people have done a jigsaw puzzle? All right, we've all done that. It's hard to find the right pieces, right? One of my favorite books is um, Good to Great by Jim, Jim Collins. And uh, he talks about not only getting the right people um, on the bus, but the right people in the right seats, right? And that's, that's the challenge, because you want to get the, the, the best people um, into the organization that can really contribute. So you're probably thinking, and Dick just did an outstanding job with just all the layers, right? That's the foundation. How do we get, you know, what do we need? And I'll just, for a, a quick tidbit on that, is that with the committees, I mean, there was like probably five or six of them. You, depending on your organization, because it, be, it should not be cookie cutter. It should be for what you need for your org. Um, you know, pick, the, I will, I'm going to recommend picking the top three that are, you think are critical, right? Because it's going to be hard to fill that, especially if you're a smaller organization. So just a quick history for me on nonprofit. So full-time, you guys probably saw in my bio, I'm, I, I'm an aerospace nerd. I like, I like planes and all the cool things that go inside of it. Uh, so that's what I do every day, uh, making sure we have outstanding components for our customers like Boeing and Airbus. And, um, but I also serve on four nonprofit boards. And this one, I get to be the vice chair, and, and Dan's the chair. Um, I'm the chair of a, a, an organization called Heaven to the Yeah, and that's supporting Olympic athletes. And that's actually based here in California. And I'm the chair of that. So I've had to do what you guys are doing in the past year, because our nonprofit is very new. Um, I'm serving as the corporate chair of Phil Cook's wife's uh, uh, organization, Influence Women. Um, and then, of course, Cleveland Orchestra just asked me to be on their board last year. And so, and when I look at those four organizations, they're really different and they're really set up. So hopefully you guys are not feeling pressured like you have to do everything that, you know, we're reviewing today. It's a guideline. But make sure you make it personal to your organization because that's how you guys are going to be set up for success. So recruiting, it's a tough one. Right? So it's saying who facilitates and, you know, who manages it. So I want to take you to the right side of the screen. There's an opportunity to use your board members, or maybe you use you set up committees, right? This is where it's kind of diversified by what you need. You might say, hey, I'm going to set up a nominating committee, or you, you have a board development committee. So there's options. There's no, it's not cookie cutter. It's, and again, it's like, what's best for your org? Do we want to, you know, do we want to have a nominating committee? Maybe it's three people, maybe it's 10 people. Um, the, the board members, right? You have your board, and your board's always going to kind of be your, your first line of defense. Um, but they don't have to be who is part of the recruiting. Maybe you have a few board members. Maybe you say, no, we want all our board members involved, right? So again, coming back to what's best for our organization. What's our goal? What's our purpose? What are we trying to accomplish? And then let's use the system that does that. Does that make sense? OK. So. You've probably heard, right, this quote, you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. How many people have actually heard that quote? It's a pretty popular quote, right? But it's very true. Um, it's, it's, and it's not only for our 
our work life, our personal life, but of course now in board development, this really, really comes true. And this was a st statistic that I found actually when I was doing a little bit of research about this. And uh, yeah, it says 41% of nonprofits struggle. I mean, 41%, that's a high percentage. That's almost half, right? That's a, that's a pretty high percentage. But struggle with recruiting quality board members who are passionate about the cause. I think boards in general, so um, we were talking about relationships and that importance. Um, I'm serving on uh, Phil Cook's wife's board, right? We are connected through Salvation Army. One of our board members, um, why am I drawing a blank on his name? Rick Osgood recruited me to, you know, he was somebody that made a recommendation to TAB to say, hey, here's somebody that you might consider. And the for-profit, I serve on a for-profit board in San Diego. How did I end up on that board? Rick Osgood recommended me, right? And said, hey, this is somebody that's, that has these skills and talents that might fit. So you have to think about that for your group now. How are we gonna get those skills and talents? So you think about attracting, engaging, you know, retaining strong board members. And, and we're gonna go through some steps here. Um, that allow you to do that. But before we jump into this, I would just like to get a couple raised hands and I'd love to hear some of the challenges that you're either facing already trying to do this or some things that you're thinking about. I'd love to just get maybe one or two examples. When you think about developing the board, what are some of the things that maybe you're apprehensive about or maybe concerned? Yes. Yeah, that's great. So your so your question kind of lines in the four steps that we're going to go through. So thanks for thanks. For, no, it's perfect. That's why I wanted to ask first. Maybe one more one more person. Any other concerns or thoughts? And I want to make sure kind of these questions right they tie into how are we going to get to creating that that excellent board that we need. Anybody else? All right. Well, we'll. We'll move forward with your, your I think your question is going to allow us to get through. So we've got the, we got the four areas. So the first one is defining the needs, right? When you think about building a solid board and for your specific board, what are those things? And again, we've got another kind of laundry list, right? Of so many things that are important, but sometimes you're going to have to maybe decide that there's three or four that are really critical, right? Because what's the mission and the purpose that you're trying to accomplish with your board? because it's not going to be the same for everybody. So it does come, come back to, again, is what are we trying to accomplish? So number one, do you have a job description, right? Every, I think every board, I think all four of the boards I serve on now, and even the two that I recently just come off of, there was no job description, right? So you might decide, you know what? We'd like to have a job description. This is bigger than just getting the right person in the right seat. We want to kind of outline and be really specific. Um, the qualifi qualifications and skills, right? That can all go in the job. A lot of this can go in the job description, but you might sit down with your leaders. If there's two of you, there's four of you, you might say, okay, what do we want out of the, the first board member, the second board member? You know, what are those skills and talents that we're looking for, right? Because you're looking for a diversified bo board of skills and experiences. So it's important to know what they are. And then also, too, you think about the benefits to your organization, but the benefits to them as well. What can they bring in? If you're saying, hey, we have decided we need to raise $56,000 every year, and you might say, okay, well, fundraising is gonna be big for us. We need a board member that's in finance, or that's a fundraiser, right? And finance, some people think, okay, we'll get somebody in finance, but somebody in finance may not be a fundraiser. They might manage the money, but they're not a fundraiser, right? A fundraiser is somebody that does what? Asks, right? Asks from it can go out. Really, say it's sales, right? Getting out there and doing sales. So you got to think about that, and that ties also into the you know the qualities and the characteristics of what you're looking for. Um, I think I was recruited. I'm trying to remember. I was recruited into this board at the time when I was actually in an inclusion and diversity role. I'm a you know like I said I'm a, I'm a business person, so I have gone since gone back to the business since that role because I, I do enjoy working with our customers, but that at the time, for the tab that was a value add background for me to under you know to have to come on to the to the team, um, and then just responsibility and authority. What are they being asked to do? It's great. You're like okay, great. We got these five board members we're recruiting in. 
but what's the responsibility? Like, what are we asking them to do? What kind of authority and decision making do they have, right? Some boards, you just have them there to just advise. Hey, we got this situation going on. We want to get the board to advise. Okay, but is the board going to make decisions? Who's making the final decision, right? So you got to be really specific in what the ask is, is going to be. And then, you know, terms, general duties, time commitment, and then, of course, legal, financial. These are all things you guys are familiar with. So, again, you know, a, another good list to think of. You don't need to be doing everything, but just pick the things that are specific to what you guys need. So the next, finding your candidates. <clears throat> so Joey was talking earlier too, you know, we wanna leverage those, those current members, right? Um, and Rick, when he recruited me to this board, right, it was his way of leveraging his network and people that he knows. So you leverage, you know, your current members to get you other, rem other members and recommend them. The local community. I mean, there's so many great community members. You guys are so involved um, on so many levels with the community. But even your community contacts, they have other people, you know. So I think it's important. It's almost like an awareness campaign. If you're brand new, you really got to put it out there that you're looking for board members. If you already have some, but you're recruiting some new, again, you want to get the community involved. You want to get them to come behind you and say, hey, we have, this is what we're doing at the Army. These are the specific three pillars that are important to our, our unit. And, you know, we, we want you to come behind us to help us, you know, support that, to promote it, kind of get it going. You know, referrals, word of mouth. I mean, every single board I'm on right now is through somebody either saying, hey, this is the skills and talents we're looking for a specific board. This is the people we know. You know, let's talk to those people. So that's helpful. And then just publicizing it, right? Whether it's like through, I, many of you have children, they're at school, they do sports. I mean, there's so many networks, right, that we weave into every single day. Um, and then also, too, there's an opportunity for that external promotion, right, of who maybe some of you already have. Maybe they're able to even connect in some other groups and also bring those networks in. So there's a lot, there's a lot of connection. Any question about you know, finding candidates? Question. Yeah. So you, you find a candidate, and maybe it's not the right candidate after a while of having that candidate. Is there like a process, or, or do they say you can't send them when you want to? Or just, I don't know how to put this in that, let's say you don't need them. They're not working for you. Right. Right, or maybe not helping or promoting you in the right way. What's your process to either correct that or to get that person to fit the needs of the, that, that arises? Yeah, that's a great question. Oh, sure. Actually, you know what? I'm going to let him repeat the question. Yeah. That's a great, yeah. So if there's an advisory board uh, person that we find but doesn't fit – maybe the criteria that we're looking for, what would be measures we can take to either build them up or you know, find a solution to help better the situation? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's a great, great question. Um, <clears throat> I think it depends on where you are with your board. If your board is brand new, and you realize early, that's going to be hard, right? To bring somebody in and then be like, we can't use you, so we're going to put you, you know, you're going to be on, you're going to put you over here. Um, you know, the first thing, and I may defer, I'm probably going to defer to the expert here to get his, to get his insight. Um, but as you're starting, you would probably try and find a different area committee. So once you get the board started and you have specific committees, and that's why I'm a big fan of don't have too many committees, right? Because you want to make sure the committees you initially establish are really successful before you branch out. And so um, I would try to move them somewhere else where their skills and talents would be value add, right? Because I always say God has gifted all of us with skills and talents, every single person. I would... I don't care if you're cleaning toilets or you're the CEO, you're blessed with skills and talents, right? Because God's designed us that way. It's just a matter of spending that extra time to figure out where their skills and talents can be value add. And so you kind of move somebody. Now, if you get it to the point where you've got somebody that's like on your board and they're not really doing anything and they're not stepping up, well, that's, that's something you kind of put in your board policies, right? When they come on board, when they, you know, whether you sign a contract or you outline the terms and conditions in their onboarding process, you know, that's, that's a great time to do that. Does that answer your question? Okay, excellent. Great. No, that was a great question. Um, okay, so let's go on a screen and select here. So when you think about now, okay, we're, we're building, we're looking at the skills and talents, we're seeing who's fitting, what we need to do. You, you decide, what are we going to do? Are we going to do an application or are we going to do an interview? 
are we going to put together the short list and then have the board come in and help us decide, or is it just going to be the committee? Um, and then what are the, you know, the expectations? So again, another list that you can pick and choose of things that you might say for your group is really imperative to make sure you get the best board possible. And then finally, and actually I should just stop because I, if anybody has any questions about this list <laughs> before I go on to our number four area. And is anything on here that you think is missing? I'm all about that constructive feedback. So, you know, I'm always, you know, just like you guys, I'm trying to get better too. So, um, is there anything you guys have thought about that maybe should be on this list that's not? Yeah, and I'm going to turn it over to, to Dick. No, 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 no. Keep, keep, I'm gonna get quick response to you, quick response to that. Number one, keep track, have your secretary keep track of every meeting attended by every board member. And it's every six months you review it with the whole board. You hand it to the board to, so they can see how many meetings every person has attended and participated in. Before you put somebody on the board, we require them to serve on a committee for at least six months. And if we, they serve six months, we're going to know pretty well. And the, other, and the last easy, there's a lot of answers and they're covered in my book, especially my new book. But the best final thing is assign a term limit Put a one-year term limit on every new member, and at the end of the year, just don't renew them. <laughs> Thank you, Dick. He's the expert. I'm still learn learning, for learning a lot from him. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. If I could add one more thing to the previous. Um, slide is perhaps a tour. I think that's always great to invite uh, prospect board members to tour your facility and also maybe attend a volunteer um, event where they can, you know, pass out food boxes, pantry. Um, that's another way of getting them involved and actually seeing everything in action, what's happening at your core. So that's just a, my recommendation. Excellent, Mariana. Thank you. Okay, and then finally, the orientation, right? The onboarding process, I think, is really, really important. Um, I think about when, so I've been with my current company, Eaton Corporation, um, for almost eight years. And, I mean, I bleed Eaton Blue. And, and really, I do because of how they recruited me and the onboarding process. And I was just so important. I was just impressed with it. And when, you know, Dick talks about, they brought that level of excellence. Like, it's pretty high. You know, and when I look at all the other companies that are out there, and sometimes we think the grass is greener, but, you know, when you're treated well and you're onboarded well, you, you kind of, you're sold out, you know, because you're like, somebody spent the extra time to make sure I had a really great experience. So you want to do that as well. And how you do that is by, and of course, I've got some things listed here that I really appreciate having. I'm kind of a detail person. I'm a numbers person. So I like seeing, like, the org chart. Who's in charge, right? Who's at the top? And then... Who's reporting and what org you know groups do we have in organizations? It's kind of nice to see that. I think 92% of the population is visual, and I'm one of those people, so it's nice to kind of see everything. Um, the annual report: What do the numbers look like? You know, where where have we been financially? And sometimes, look, people will say, "Yeah, year over year," but I like to see the five years. What's been going on? You know, uh, you raised maybe 50, that fifty-six thousand dollars the first year, but only maybe twenty-nine thousand the next, and then there's maybe you were back to fifty-six. So. You know, we're able to ask questions like, hey, what happened that year, right? So now coming out of COVID, a lot of us are saying, hey, that was COVID, that was a COVID time, right? Um, and then the strategic plan. What's the game plan? What, you know, what are the key strategic initiatives um, that, that the division is working on? There's usually some bigger, right? There's some bigger army strat plan, and, but there's divisional and unit, and so that's got to be really important. And then if you have a video, that's awesome. I mean, every, we're so visual now, right? We love media stuff, so videos are great. As you saw, I kicked off my presentation with one, and I have Phil and Kathleen Cook to thank for that because that's what they do, and they've taught me, and I've taken that idea from them. So don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then just having a presentation and then making sure there's some training. But just make sure you have an onboarding package. Like, I think it's nice to get something physically. You can also send something digitally. Um, but, you know, really display that you, you and your organization have spent time to say, hey, we really value you. And here's all the information. Welcome on board. And then finally, just a little bit on the relationships and networking piece. Um, I want you guys to really be committed to working the rooms you sit in every day. You guys are together. This is where we, you know, we, we have these areas where we work. Um, 
But think about the other places that you sit, right? You're at your child's basketball game, hockey game, ice skating. I'm Canadian, so I only do winter stuff. Um, so that's where I would be. But um, but seriously, like any any sporting events, you're in the grocery store. I mean, w God has us out all the time with people, and there's you would just never believe the connections. And I'm going to share a quick story. Um, so the Heaven to the End nonprofit's just over a year, um, and our purpose is equity advancement in, uh, for underrepresented sports. So I had seven Olympic athletes. Three of them are actually Christian athletes, and we just did a fundraiser in Cleveland. Um, that's this past Saturday night. And literally, you guys, 10 days ago, we had sold 12 tickets. And my goal was to sell 50. And I'm not from the region. I don't really have a network. But you know, you had prayed. I was like, Lord, you're going to have to have these people show up. Somebody needs to help. And God descended some really amazing believers through Fellowship of Christian Athletes and some other things to help us get to this place. But it was through these networks and through people and just mentioning, hey, this is what we've got coming up. Do you know anybody that loves sports or loves athletes or is tying into equity advancement or is an equity champion? And you guys, in 10 days, we sold 58 tickets to this event. But it really came down to, for me, committing to reaching out to the few people that I did know in this area that could help us fill the room. And so I want you guys to commit to working the rooms that you sit in every day. Even the people that you're like, well, I'm not really sure, ask them anyway. Just talk to them. Tell them about what you're doing. Because people want to be a part of things, right? God designed us to be with people, to be a part of things. And people want to get on board. Um, I had three, I literally met two older gentlemen who, um, it's kind of, <laughs> kind of funny story. Um, Tim Tebow came to town with Craig Groeschel. And um, they were let me know they're coming to town. And they're like, you really should come to this event. That's actually the game-changing event because I went to this event. They had VIP tickets, so they let me go with them. And, I, and that night I met some people, and we had three tables of 10 that came out of this event that I just went, and I didn't know anybody, but I was like, I'm just going to talk. I said, Lord, I'm just going to talk to some people, right? So I want you to just think of all the places you are all the, all the time where you can just plant seeds, start building those relationships because you'll never know who you're going to meet who will direct you to the next person, the next person. And before you know it, you've got board members from just meeting one or two people. So it's a powerful tool, right, to engage with your network. But I want you to think inside the box. This is what I'm talking about. Everybody says think outside the box. No, I'm, I'm a inside, a inside the box because we already kind of know all the people we need to know, right? But have we done a good job of kind of massaging those relationships and those people that we know? And so church community, school community, right? Groups, sports organizations, social media. I mean, you can get a fun little social media post. Hey, we're recruiting for this initiative, or we have this fundraiser coming up. And you'd be amazed how many people that are like, wow, I'm really passionate about that. Or, the, or their friends saw it, and they'll tell them. So let's be a little bit more engaged that way, and I think that will help. And then just, you know, Become a scout, like in the video. He was talking about <laughs> scouting. He was a football, what do you say, he's a football scout? Hey, you kind of get to be a, a football scout, you know, in this, in this venture. So, but be thinking, like, where you can leverage your skills. Like, diversity of perspectives, I think that's huge. You know, um, when I think about the boards that have recruited me in, it's because I bring a different perspective, right? I'm somebody, I'm Canadian, I'm from a different country. Um, I speak French, I speak a different language. Um, how I ended up on Cleveland Orchestra's board, a lot of people were like, how'd you end up on that? Well, I'm classically trained on the piano. I studied at the Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto, and the director of development found out I was in Ohio and was like, can you be on my board? So if you do plant seeds with people about the stuff that you do, you know, um, it, will, it can lead, right, to getting that right board member. So just nurture that leadership, building trust with open communication. These are just all things, little tidbits that have been really helpful, and I think it hopefully will be really helpful for you guys. So to wrap up, just a couple final tips and takeaways. So I'm going to go to the right side first because Dick started us with organizing the board. you got to do that first, right? Um, and once you've done that, set the goals and make sure they're specific to the needs that you guys have for your specific unit. Um, and then those committees, same thing. Don't need all of them, but... You know, make sure you probably have at least three and make sure they're the ones that make sense. Are we trying to fundraise? Are we trying to build? Are we, you know, whatever those goals are. And then your recruiting, recruitment plan, right? Decide what you're going to do. Hey, we're going to do a job description or maybe we'll just do the interview. Are we going to bring them on campus? But make a decision and then, and then stick to that. And then finally just execute and have fun, right? 
That's what you want to do. So diversity on the board, make sure you get different skills and talents. The communication, it's so important to keep lines of communication. So if you have certain units that you guys kind of work together, make sure you're communicating too. You don't want to do things in silos because that happens. Because guess what? A lot of times we find out duplication of work has happened. Nobody wants to find out like three people are working on the same thing, right? So make sure everybody's communicating, all the constituent groups are in there. Um, you know, and just, you know, that orientation piece. I think this, the, the, the professional delivery is so important, right? The communication and making people feel welcome and excited. And then um, that, you know, the community outreach, right? That awareness campaign. Let people know what you're doing, whether it's go on social media. Hey, we got these flyers. We're going to put them up at the, I'm thinking the grocery stores here, like Safeway, Trader Joe's. You know, you just never know. Coffee shops. I mean, put a pin in. They all have those community boards. You're recruiting a board member, right? Get a little different in how you advertise. All right. Well, that is what we have. And I know we had some questions potentially. Um, Please note my email, and if you want specific information, email me. Yes, we put both of our emails on there. I would say email the expert. <laughs> I, I would, I'm still emailing the expert. <laughs> Holly wants us. Can I make one more comment? By the way, by the, by the way, your question is answered on page nine. The uniform changes things for you guys. When you go into the rotary, when I went into the rotary, they wouldn't even let me in. When you walk in in uniform, you're going to be greeted and royally met. You're going to reach. When I take a brand new officer into the mayor's office, instant recognition. You guys, that uniform changes life. So I have two comments. Number one, appreciate it. And number two, live up to it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, and I, I want to just add one little thought. One of the things that I learned just in pastoring a church in Los Angeles is that sometimes we can get so comfortable with the language with, of the church and we're trying to reach a community, right? So it's the same with board members. So don't get so... Salvation Army ease, you know, that language that you don't, that they don't understand what you're talking about. So when you're onboarding or when you're recruiting a, a board member, when you're trying to get somebody into the circle, you start using things like TAB and Echelon and ARC and they don't have a clue what you're talking about, right? But you're using it like secondary, like you should know this or even the, 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 um, the order of like who's the lieutenant and who's a colonel and that's not that's not normal for the average person. They don't get that, right? So you're, so having a organizational flow chart would be really helpful. So I'm just saying, don't assume people while your uniform gets you in the door and it's respected. Yes, don't assume people know what that means, right? So just when you're talking to people, just just yeah, assume they know nothing about the Salvation Army. And so that's why, to Mariana's point, a tour is huge because it takes people into the real workings of what the Salvation Army does. Right? And then be patient. I had no idea what all the terms were. So just be patient with people as they're learning a new language called you know, the Salvation Army Ease. Um, all right, I'm going to give a few announcements as we uh, get out of here. To lunch, anybody hungry? Yes, okay. Um, we are going to head to the... Uh, terrace room, but you're going to enter through the side door of the terrace room near the patio furniture outside. Don't go the regular way through the lunch line, because today you special people, all right? So don't go the regular way. All right, we're going to, uh, you'll head in there, you'll get seated, and then the lunch session, because of course we're going to work through lunch, that's what we do. There's a lunch session that will begin at 11.45. Um, and then after lunch, everyone's going to come back to your seats by 12.30. And we're going to kick off the next session. How many second-year cadets are in here? Okay, all second-year cadets, you're going to stay. You'll come right back to this room. Uh, and you'll be in session eight. First-year cadets, hands up. All right, you will go to classroom G for sessions B. Now, here's the thing. You're going to need to know everything that's taught in both of them. And so remember, it's all online. It'll be available to you. You'll get to hear it again and again because you don't want to actually miss the brilliance that will be in, at all the sessions. So, uh, all right, everybody stand up. Go to lunch.
so hard just to not want to jump up and get in. I, 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 and I just. I mean, you were so successful. 